What Can We Say About Monarch Legacy of Monsters Episode 8? Bloody hell, that was a lot more jam-packed than the other episodes. I was going to say problematic as well, but let's be honest, most of the series has been problematic. Before I go on, I want to address my video capture problems from last week. I did not figure out why this suddenly wasn't working anymore, nor did I figure out how to solve it. Instead, I have fallen back on that good old chestnut, recording the TV with my phone. Try and stop me now, Apple. Anyway, on to episode 8. The two stories in this episode are as follows. In 2015, Shaw is going to blow up the hole Keiko died in, while the Randa kids figure out where he is to follow him. In 1956, Monarch is fighting to stay in business. And that's pretty much it. My unvoiced criticisms of the previous episodes are holding true even this close to the end of the series, which will be episode 10, by the way. But despite the story split leading to less plot points overall, episode 8 manages to cram in a lot of substance with character work. For instance, Shaw wants to tell people about Godzilla being alive, Keiko and Bill don't. He wants to know where the monsters are, so the obvious solution is to find him one. When well, Godzilla saved our asses last time. No. If we tell them that the biggest H-bomb we've ever tested didn't kill it... They'll build a bigger one. Which they're gonna do anyway. We made a pact. We only share what they need to know. You don't think this qualifies? These attitudes are reflected in the future, with Monarch's policies and Shaw's attitudes. Monarch can cherry-pick any piece of data they want to justify continually sitting on their hands. There's no time for indecision, Kate, especially when you've already seen what indecision can cost you. Furthermore, whilst Keiko and Bill do all they can to save Monarch without mentioning Godzilla's last sighting, it's sure Blavin that gets the job done. Will this have consequences for the Monarch team's relationship? Possibly, which might be explored when... I'm getting ahead of myself. It's not just attitudes that are carried over from one time to the next. Oof. Going a little stir crazy in here? Or? This is your legacy. This is the new life. Can you please clean up after yourself? Oh, how did you manage to get ants four stories underground? Travel vouchers, requisition for office supplies. But here's an invoice for an exterminator. Did you ever throw anything away? No. Which is ultimately a sad thing, because so much of it is part of a lost legacy that not even Monarch itself seems to acknowledge. Going a little stir-crazy in here? Or? I inherited that from someone with a temper. I don't see any randas up here. I thought we were Monarch royalty. Missing, presumed, killed. Randa, Keiko. Monarch cost us our father and both our grandparents. Ken and Kate's relationship is beginning to fracture apart again, which may or may not be due to May. Actually, this brings me on to something that our boy Omni talked about in his episode 7 review. The evidence does seem to at least be skewing in that direction, that Kate and May are going to at least form something of a romantic bond as the episodes progress from here. Again, I could be wrong, but it seems like that's the direction it's going. And if it is, like I said, where the heck did that come from? To be fair, Monarch Legacy of Monsters did try and set up the relationship between Kate and May. We obviously knew Ken and May hooked up, then split up, causing bad vibrations between them. Kate managed to get on May's good side from the word go. Nah, he's a delight. I like you. I don't like this line anywhere, ever. In episode 4, Kate talks May through nearly dying, leading to this shot that mimics Ken and May's earlier scenes. In return, May talks Kate through her shell shock in San Francisco, strengthening their bond. These instances informed Kate's determination to save May from pre-apex, and their embrace at the end of episode 7. It also leads to... Well, wait, wait, we're not there yet. 
So May and Kate being a thing is informed to an extent. There is the issues of Kate being angry with May in episode 6, which should have affected their relationship, but is entirely forgotten. Plus, isn't it weird to be getting with your brother's ex in front of your brother? So yeah, informed, flawed, weird, and unnecessary. But there it is. Anyway, back to Ken and Kate. Our father worked for these people. He made that map. And we took it to Shaw. I understand if you need to leave. I'm not leaving, but I'm not cleaning up his mess. I'm not doing this for him. We've had hints of Ken siding with Shaw in episode 6, his upset with his father and by Proxy Monarch in episode 7. He was even so determined he was right in episode 4, he nearly died to prove it. So his upset at being pulled and pushed by Monarch and Kate to where he thinks he doesn't need to go could very well tip him over to help ensure. Or at least that would be a plot point if they didn't keep forgetting about him. Tim seems to think that your bloodline gives you some unique insight into the situation. Like, I don't see how, but I am running out of options. So I need you to think about your father, about this map that he made, and about where it's leading Shaw. Don't fancy talking to Ken there? No? Okay. And this brings us onto the child. We've assumed since the show started that Ken and Kate were Bill Rander's grandchildren. It was hinted at a few times that Shaw might be the actual grandfather. In this very episode, we have suggestions for both. He's obviously got your brains. Obviously. And he'll be blessed with my gravity-defying breaking curveball. When we were in the desert, the way he talked about our grandmother, I thought he was gonna tell me he was our grandfather. And then Monarch Lom says, nope, it's neither. It's Keiko's kid with nothing to do with either of the men. On the one hand, this makes Bill Rando look even more of a chad than he already is by having him help Keiko when he didn't need to. This is led up to throughout the episode and in some snippets from previous episodes, showing them connecting and bonding over their work. Proximity equals attraction and all that. On the other hand, now neither of the male protagonists from the 1950s plotline actually have a legacy in Monarch Legacy of Monsters. So much for the show's title being ironic. There's other stuff I want to mention, lots of little niggles here and there, but I can't hold back much longer. We need to talk about the ending. Bloody hell, the ending. At the start of Monarch Legacy of Monsters Episode 8, Shaw arrives at the nuclear meltdown site where we saw Keiko die in Episode 1. He's here to plant explosives and collapse the hole, just like at the end of Episode 7. The hole looks nothing like the one we saw in Episode 1, nor did we see the swirly Aurora Borealis coming out of it like in the Alaskan hole. But fuck it, who cares about continuity, eh? Between the start and the end of episode 8, the Randa kids and co are trying to work out where Shaw has gone, how to get where he is, and what to do when they arrive. All the while they are dredging through Monarch's past, arguing with higher ups, and conflicting with each other. And despite all of this, they arrive at the hole in Kazakhstan where they aren't allowed to be by the way, before Shaw has blown the hole up. Fucking how? We get the nice detail of shrubbery around the hole linking up to killing the monsters, but then we get this from Tim. It's a portal. It's an entry point. To where? Tinfoil hat land. Based on what Titan Tim says here and what happens moments from now, I think Monarch Lom is telling us this is... I can't. I don't. I won't. Fuck me, it's the goo from Godzilla vs Kong. It doesn't look like the goo, it's not expressly described or elaborated on as being the goo, but without other explanations, it sounds like the goo, which in itself is unexplained. And things only get worse. The team are surrounded at gunpoint, and Kate goes 
full go boss mode. Everyone stop. No one is shooting anyone. Which isn't the first time she's done this in this series. Because it's possible we're all about to be buried by whatever Shaw has planned. Did you think about that? Hey, Miss Randa, you're getting back on a plane. Don't talk to me like that. I don't work for you. Or even this episode. My team will go in first, assess the situation. We'll bring you in once we fill the area secure. This isn't gonna work. We're gonna find Shaw. And if the first thing he sees is your team pointing guns at him, this isn't gonna turn out the way we want. Just when you think the bitch is gone, she comes crawling out of the shadows. Speaking of which, Shaw comes crawling out of the shadows. Well, you finally made it. Was he standing there waiting for his cue? Was he having a piss and only just caught up? What the fuck was he doing? Shaw and Kate have a private chat about Keiko, and we examine the fact Shaw did what he did and is doing what he's doing for Keiko. I do hope that Drs. Mira and Rana's position as sole authority over Project Monarch's scientific operations will remain unchallenged. Stopping monsters and saving the world. This is to make up for losing her, isn't it? Well, of course it is. But that's not really possible now, is it? But I can still honor the work that Billy and Keiko were trying to do. We also get this line. It's not about the data, Kate. It's all about belief. Now that's wonderful. Most of the thematics of Kill the Monsters surrounded belief, how much of it each character had, how it affected their choices, how they should balance it with facts and knowledge. To hear Shaw say this is like plucking the thematic narrative out of Kill the Monsters and airdropping it like a saving grace into Monarch Lom. Shaw is the bad guy for the very reason Jonah is reinforcing the idea one will lead to the other, or at the very least, will inform or inspire the other. I'm finding it ever more fascinating how connections to Kin of the Monsters are really quite well done and profound, and the connections to Godzilla vs Kong are bloody awful. Case in point. There's a world down there, Kate. I know. Because I've been to it. You fucking what, mate? Are you telling me you went through this without protection? We're about to be launched a thousand miles in two seconds until gravity inverts itself and spits us into free fall. This question, this problem, might be answered in episode 9 by finding out the goo isn't a thing, in which case that will be the first retcon I will be fully behind. How they explain the Godzilla vs. Con Hollow Earth after that will be interesting. But wait, it gets worse. The final, final scene of the episode is this absolute fuster cluck. The bombs are set off with what looks like two minutes to make a run for it. At the exact same time, the ground shakes because a monster is arriving. Now that's timing. Ken goes to leave, but May wants to go get Kate, and ends up falling in the hole. Look at this picture. This is where May was. Why the fuck did she walk this bloody close to the hole during an earthquake? What is wrong with her? May falls in the hole, and the monster climbs out of it. One happens right after the other. So I'm going to go ahead and assume May was eaten by the big bug. I mean, what else could have happened? The bug rises up and roars at Kate, who sits there staring at it. Move your tiny little munchkin ass. Run, instead of... Wait, what? Monarch Lom editing strikes again. These two frames are side by side. You thought we wouldn't notice, didn't you, show? you lazy gits. Anyway, Shaw tries to save Kate, but the concrete slab takes them both into the hole, which he wasn't standing on, so not sure how that works. Honestly, this whole scene is an editing nightmare. In amongst all this, Tim looks to be crushed, and Ken gets blown up. So at the end of this episode, everyone is dead. May's dead. Kate's dead. 
Shaw's dead. Tim's dead. Ken's dead. He's dead, Dave. Everybody is dead. Everybody is dead, Dave. <laughs> Some traumatic amount of bullshit is going to need to happen to save this lot. The least shitty piece would be May, Kate and Shaw fell into the goo into the hollow earth and somehow survived that way. But if that's the case, it opens the door to Keiko surviving the same way. Possibly. I mean, she had a lot of bugs on her. Also, Shaw said he went into the hollow earth but still believes Keiko is dead. So either he went down a different hole and didn't find her, or he went down this one and found her corpse. If the former is true, then perhaps we might get a meeting between the two and a little chat about what the fuck he's been doing. My bet's on the latter. Actually, his going to the Hollow Earth explains how he knew about the holes in Episode 7. It's not a good explanation, but there we are. And whilst I remember, the Kazakhstan hole briefly shows Aurora Borealis coming out of it before the building collapses, which means it did in fact have radiation seeping out of it, which also means the lot of them have been horrifically irradiated. Wait, is that why Shaw has lived as long as he has? Oh fuck off if that's the explanation. Right, that's it, we're done, I don't, I can't, I can't, I can't take this anymore. See you next week if I can recover in time. Last but not least, thank you for watching.